Thank you. Now, I actually had written this wonderful disclaimer that I'm not going to be using uh, because I was told the audience I was anticipating was not the audience I was going to get. I'll be honest, I'm probably happier with that, with it being that way. Uh, I do understand the controversial nature, both of both what Darwin first published and as the controversy exists today. So I, with that in mind, I put this presentation together, trying not to be insensitive to some folks. But I'm going to start this off. Oh, that's right, I can't just hold it, I gotta point it. Uh-oh. I'm sorry, your presentation's gotta go. Sorry. <laughs> Quiz time again! Uh, <laughs> no! I've got flashcards. Well, no. Okay. <laughs> I'm not going to oh, promise anything. Like <laughs> you killed my presentation! Sorry, Jim. There we go. Darwin went to the moon. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what? You're talking about the time Darwin went to the moon. <laughs> Okay, now let's start that again. I don't believe in evolution. And I'm saying that as an absolute truth. I do not. With that in mind, let's move on forward. Now, a lot of times you hear the word theory used. For example, when people talk about evolution, they dismiss it by saying, it's just, just a theory. theory. We'll we have somebody say, you know, they, they have an idea about something. That, well, I, I have, have a theory. theory. And, and then, then, of course, my favorite one that's come up of late, conspiracy theory. So, we'll look at what this talk is going to be about. First of all, well, we're going to look at what the word theory means. The scientific method and how it applies to evolutionary biology. We said the meaning of the word theory. Oops, I got my notes in the wrong order. And then the evidence supporting modern evolutionary theory. But we have to have a little background, and our background, it doesn't exactly start with this guy, but this is where it all seems to focus. Charles Darwin, born February 12th, 1809, died April 19th, 1882. Today is February 12th. Happy birthday, Charles Darwin. <clears throat> now, his father, Robert, was a doctor. Gee, I wonder where he got his middle name. He wanted him to be a doctor, so he sent Charles to medical school. Darwin hated the lectures. He thought they were boring. And surgery made him squeamish. So, he wasn't going to be a doctor, so his father got the idea of sending him to divinity school to become an Anglican pastor. And he realized that he would much rather go out horseback riding and hunting. Well, he was introduced to collecting beetles, which apparently was a very popular pastime in the 1830s, or actually in the early 1800s. There's a story that they talk about Darwin going out collecting beetles. He saw a beetle that he thought was very interesting, so he grabbed it in one hand. And the bark fell off the tree, and he spotted another beetle, so he put it in his other hand, and that revealed a third beetle that he hadn't seen before. <coughs> so he took the second beetle and popped it in his mouth. The beetle he popped in his mouth was a click beetle. A click beetle takes two very acrid chemicals, mixes them together, which causes a chemical reaction, which then explodes in boiling hot gases in his mouth. He lost all three beetles. And when somebody asked him, uh, what his studies revealed to him about the nature of the creator of the universe, he said he has an inordinate fondness for beetles. <clears throat> this is young Charles. As a, he, he really didn't have a whole lot of focus in his life. He just he became interested in natural history, didn't really study it professionally, but picked it up on his own. So he was given the opportunity to sail aboard the HMS Beagle, by the way, for those of you who are here for trivia, with Robert Fitzroy, oh. captain. Now, he wasn't hired as the ship's naturalist. The ship's naturalist was actually, sorry, 
Rob, a surgeon named Robert McCormick. Darwin was hired to be a gentleman companion, basically somebody that the captain could talk to who was learned, high-born companion. And the surgeon kind of fit that, but was not quite as high-born as Darwin. However, uh, Darwin did the job of naturalist. And McCormick got so fed up that eventually when they reached Brazil, he caught a ship back to England and Darwin took over as the naturalist on the Beagle. And he had a problem because he loved being on the ship when the ship wasn't sailing. When the ship was sailing, he got violently seasick. And he wrote just, he's, even though he was sick, he wrote copious, copious notes about the voyage. And that made uh, Fitzroy very happy. So they sailed to the Galapagos, and that's where history changed. By the way, the answer to the other question, finches. He noticed a wide diversity of life, but one thing he noticed is that on each island there seemed to be a different kind of finch. There was one bird he actually misidentified. He thought it was a wren. It turned out to be a finch. And you notice that each bird seemed to be adapted to whatever food was available on that particular island. If there were a lot of insects, they had beaks that were designed for insects. Uh, some of them actually used tools. They would pick up blades of grass to catch ants and termites because that's what the food was. Some of them had beaks that were more fit for cracking open tough seeds. Some of them ate leaves. And that started getting him thinking about this idea. So he returned to England in 1836 and then worked for the better, for more than 20 years and I'm going to ask you to correct me if I'm wrong in my trivia. Where'd you go? In 1859? Yes. All right. 100 years before I was born. That's how I remember. Uh, he wrote a book called On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or, and I can't read it, that's the rest of the answer. Oh. Yeah. And it was a smash. People loved the book. It went into uh, second printings right away. And at the time, most people really accepted it, but there were some people who rejected it. They didn't like the idea because it took man and basically made him one of the animal kingdom. And a lot of people didn't like that idea. Now, his wife did not want him to publish. And he was very aware of the controversy his book was going to create. In fact, he was prepared not to publish it. He was going to bin the whole thing. But Alfred Russell Wallace, answered a trivia question one, had also been working on a similar book, but he wasn't ready to publish yet. Now, he and Darwin published a tract, and then he convinced Darwin, you really need to publish the book. So if it weren't for Alfred Russell Wallace, we would have never seen this book. However, we would probably still have the idea of evolution through natural selection, because Wallace was working on that same idea. So instead of people talking about Darwinian evolution, they would be talking about Wallachian evolution. <laughs> so here's Darwin's theory in a nutshell. Every environment has enough resources to maintain a certain number of organisms. Organisms will usually produce more offspring than the environment can support. So in every population, there are a wide variety of inherited traits. And if you don't believe me, look around the room. There are a lot of inherited traits in this room. We are all very different. So organisms that have traits that work well in an environment will survive to reproduce. Those that don't have those traits, not so much. They won't. They may survive to reproduce, but they will not do it as well. And eventually you will get one that is a little bit more dominant than the others. And over time, the traits between different animals or plants will be e different enough that they will not be able to interbreed successfully. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. And at that point, they become separate species. Now, I've got bad news for those of you who uh, look at evolution. 
For any species, the ultimate outcome of evolution is extinction. There will come a time when Homo sapiens sapiens will be extinct. The good news. For any species, you may leave offspring and will eventually develop into new species. That, like I said, the ultimate outcome is extinction. But if you're fortunate, you will leave offspring and then eventually have a new species. Now there are mechanisms of evolution. Artificial selection, natural selection, and then the one that makes people blush, but it's in there. And Darwin wrote about it. Sexual selection. We're going to look at each of these in turn. Artificial selection is basically humans sort of interfering with the natural reproductive cycle of animals or plants in order to produce desirable traits. Now, I read recently that it's possible that the first to actually do this weren't human beings, but were bees. Because bees would select certain plants. And the ones that caught their attention, the bees would go to, get the nectar, and pollinate them. But the ones that didn't get the bees' attention so much, they didn't get pollinated, they didn't reproduce. So artificial selection isn't always human-caused, but for the most part, for the for this discussion, we're going to talk about humans being involved with it. And there are reasons we do it. Increased food production. You have wheat, and you find out that a particular seed will grow five bushels of wheat per acre, and another will grow only four. You're going to plant the seed that does five bushels. And if you find that there's a seed in, the in succeeding generations that produces more, those are the ones you're going to plant. Physical attractiveness. Now this is incredibly sub subjective. This is the world champion Boston Bull Terrier from 1915. But through selective breeding, they have changed this creature. This is the same species 99 years later. Same species, same breed. I bought the world champion Boston Bull Terrier for 2014. So it's subjective. I personally find the first dog a lot more attractive. <laughs> Disposition and behavior. We through domestication of animals. We want dogs that are loyal, strong, will protect us. We want cats that are cute and fuzzy and cuddly and loving. Uh, we want fish that are, have a particular, you know, well, fish not so much personality and behavior. <laughs> Sorry, I, my train of thought went I'm back on track. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, we want our animals to behave in a certain manner. Come on in. <coughs> Speed and athleticism. The fastest horse to run the Kentucky Derby was Secretary in 1978. Ran one minute and 30 seconds faster than the first horse to win the Kentucky Derby through selective breeding, artificial selection, breeding for horses that are faster. And this will show you how much we've changed some things. What you see there on the left, that's wild corn. That is corn as it grows. On the right, okay, you go to the supermarket and you go to buy some corn. Which one do you want to eat? <laughs> because that stuff on the left doesn't look so good. Of course, I could also make a comment about bananas, but Ray Comfort isn't here. <laughs> And natural selection. Well, Darwin got the idea because he had been looking at pigeons and he had been talking about people, or talking with people who raised pigeons. And there were actually pigeons that were, they, they couldn't fly anymore. They'd been bred specifically for how they looked rather than how they could fly. And he thought, well, human beings, by the way, that's an answer to another one trivia question. Human beings could make a change like that. And he thought, well, what about natural pressures? What about something in the natural world? And that's when he started thinking about his finches. This particular island, the finches, you know, it has a lot of seeds, but not a lot of insects. The, the finches that have the beaks for seeds, they're going to reproduce successfully because of that natural pressure on them. The ones that uh, have the beaks for insects, they're not going to do as well on that island, but they might do better on another island. 
Here's some natural selection for you. If you can. <laughs> this is for weeding out some of the some of the members of our herd. Uh, if, if you can't read, yeah. But climate change actually is a factor. Uh, one factor that took place in our own evolution years and years and years ago was there was a major earthquake in Africa that caused a rift valley. And you had certain hominid species on one side of the rift and certain hominid species on the other side of the rift who eventually became separate species. Migration. When you have animals undergoing migration, one of the things that really can cause a species to divide is by into two species is actually having a species divide physically, go into different places and into isolation. So not all of the wildebeest are going to wind up in the same place. Also, the ones that do better in migration, they're going to reproduce. The ones that don't do so well in migration, they're not going to reproduce. And predators prey. There's an arms race in the natural world. The fish that can evade the hawk there, that's a fish that's going to reproduce. The hawk that can catch the fish is the one that's going to live to reproduce. So if the hawk gets faster, then the fish have to get a little faster. And those fish that are slightly faster or dart to one side a little bit differently, they're going to reproduce. And that's why we see cheetahs that can run over 100 miles an hour. Because they have to get faster because the animals they're hunting are getting faster. <coughs> it is not survival of the fittest. Darwin himself probably put it best when he said, It is not the strongest of the species that survives, nor the most intelligent, but the one most responsive to change. And our world is constantly changing, so animals have to change as well. And if an animal doesn't change and can't adapt to a change in its environment, it goes extinct. Sometimes human beings cause those changes in the environment. That's why we see a lot of extinctions going on. <coughs> we were talking about survival of the fittest. It doesn't have to be the fittest, just a little better than the other guy. Let me know when you're ready. I don't have to outrun the lion. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> yeah. Who reproduces? The one who can outrun the other guy. And it's not a random process. Now, it takes place through random changes in our genetics. But there is a driving force behind it. Again, when you have a wide variety of genes, yes, there's a lot of randomness in those genes. But the genes that survive, that help you survive to reproduce, they breed true and they keep going. The ones that aren't there, you don't breed, they don't breed true. And it's not about improvement. Because going back to the idea of survival of the fittest, it's not about improvement, it's not about making a species better, just more adapted to its environment. And a good example of this are small rabbits. Now I'm going to tell you right now, I have never done this, I've been told it can be done that you can scream at a baby rabbit and scare it to death. That their little hearts will stop. But that little rabbit has nine brothers and sisters who you didn't scream at. They're not particularly fit animals, but they reproduce very well. So that's how they survive. If you think about it in the natural world, a rabbit's a lunchbox with legs. Because that seems to be their little niche in nature. And it is a gradual process. Um, I had a relative who once thought that she had put the nail in the coffin of evolution when she stated, well, if a dinosaur was born with a feather, then its parents would kill it as a freak. And apparently she figured she'd won because I was so dumbfounded I couldn't speak. <laughs> you ever just have somebody say something that's just so ridiculous you just can't help but squint? <laughs> that was the situation I was in there. <clears throat> because she got the idea that it happened suddenly, this it's a very gradual process. And one way to talk about that is by looking at color. Oh, got a little ahead of myself there. Every plant and animal born on this, uh, born is on the planet, is the same species as its parents. You notice there's a little asterisk there. Sometimes you can take two different species and breed them together. For example, a horse and a donkey will make a mule. One thing you will find is that at least one of the genders 
of those offspring is usually sterile and cannot give birth. For example, if you take a ti tiger and a lion together, the males are sterile, the females are not. But you, they are considered to be separate species because both offspring aren't exactly like their parents. So we're going to talk about a little inherited traits. This handsome fellow here is James William Henry Britton. The fellow on the left there is uh, his son, that is George William Britton and his wife, Livesey. This is their son, that's James Bernard Britton. And that's their daughter, Frances Britton, and her husband, Thomas. And <laughs> now I've got traits from every single one of these people. It's really scary. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that has always frightened me. But that, yeah, that's my, let's see, grandfather, great-grandfather, great-great-grandfather. And yeah, the, rese the resemblance, although well, you'll notice he has blue eyes, his light eyes. My father has brown eyes. That's going to be important here in a few moments. <clears throat> Keep forgetting, I got a point. So, inherited traits and being gradual. Now you see the red bar on the left and the blue bar on the right. Now, if you were to examine this pixel by pixel, what you would find is that the pixels here have just a little blue in them. Now, it's not visible, and if you look over on the other side, the pixels here, pure blue on the right, but as you go to the left, just a slight amount of red. So a lot of people, times you have, you know, well, where was the first human? There wasn't. That's a little bit like asking, Where's the last red and where's the first blue? It is a very gradual process. Now in some cases, you'll notice there, now we have green and blue over on the right and red on the left. And if you look at the green, if you come in a few pixels, and you did an examination, there's actually a little red in there. Same with the blue. But somewhere along the line, they diverged and you wound up with two species of colors. And that's really kind of how it works in biological <coughs> evolution. And this is what we were all shown in school, that stair step, you know, the ascent of man. Wrong. <laughs> that is not the way it works. It's not one stair step. You'll also see in like a lot of uh, hi natural history books, from the 1930s and 40s, they show life as rungs on a ladder, with man at the top of the ladder, and you know, amoebas and so on at the bottom of the ladder, and everything else in between. And it's not that stair step. It's more like a family tree, and this is one little tiny branch of the family tree. And if you actually look at all the different names there, there's only one that survives today. Although Neanderthalensis, they say that some of those are in some of our genetics, some of us more so than others. My supervisor's here, so I can't make jokes about him. <laughs> <clears throat> and I won't. Oh, sexual selection. Now, no, I'm not going to go into the details. Organisms expend a lot of energy and a lot of resources to reproduce. And it takes a lot of energy and resources. And I actually was fortunate. I, just finished. I want to hear that joke later. I'm actually fortunate, actually, uh, because right behind me, we just finished up our Earth Magic. We have apples and flowers, which are on my next... A flower provides absolutely no benefit to the, planet that, or to the plant that produces it. An apple produces absolutely no benefit to the tree except to pass on its genetic material. In the case of a flower, it's pretty, it takes a lot of energy to produce a flower, but it attracts a bee, the bee goes in, pollen gets stuck on its legs, it flies off to another flower and they reproduce. An apple, I come along, I grab an apple, I eat it. It's biodegradable, so I throw it out in the field. 
and it grows a new apple tree. That's a lot of energy for something that doesn't really do that any, do it any good. You find the same thing in the animal kingdom. A peacock's tail actually inhibits its ability to fly. It can fly, it just doesn't do it quite as well. But that display tells the female, I am a strong, fertile male. I'm the mate you want. The peacock guppy, brightly colored, attracts a mate. Also attracts predators. But again, that's energy for nothing other than reproduction. It does not do the organism itself any good. This is a nest of a bowerbird. Males, male bowerbirds will make these nests, and they're OCD about it. They will gather various things. Like you see the, the fruit all there gathered in the front, and they have little nuts on the side. And a lot of times they'll gather little, gather little pieces of colored glass. And they found out that bowerbirds seem to have a fondness for blue glass. So they'll gather up the blue glass and put it all together. The male will never live in that nest, but it's showing the female. I provided a nest for you. Look at all this neat stuff I got for you. That's a lot of energy that does the male bowerbird absolutely no benefit as far as living. <clears throat> and of course, there's providing, you know, you want to show that you can provide for your mate. <clears throat> oh, I got ahead of myself. Competition. We see, you know, here we have the uh, bighorn sheep and the prairie chickens. The bighorn sheep are butting their heads together. I never liked watching that on, oh, on uh, Wild Kingdom. It always gave me a headache. And then the prairie chickens dance around. Again, a lot of energy expended. And in the case, not necessarily bighorn sheep, but we find with elk, they will kill each other. They actually run the risk of dying. All for reproduction. Now to the part about providing for our... We want to show that we can provide. <laughs> and some not as well as others. <laughs> Guess which one I drove in high school? <laughs> I can tell you, it does not help you find a mate. <laughs> but uh, that, actually, no, that, that's not the car I drove, but I drove a 59 Plymouth Belvedere that was that rusted out. <laughs> hey, it got me from point A to point B. Now, sexual reproduction is advantageous on a species-wide level. You, do a, you get a wider genetic variety. These are all kittens of the same litter, but you can see there's a lot of genetic variety in there. And there are different reasons to have good genetic variety. For example, some people have natural immunities to certain diseases. And if you can get that into a population where that disease might happen, for example, there are some folks in Africa who have an allele that makes them resistant to malaria. Unfortunately, that same one also carries sickle cell anemia. So sometimes there are trade-offs. So here we have inherited traits. This is what's called a genetic uh, cross diagram. And the father is somebody who has one parent with brown eyes and one parent with blue eyes. And whatever you see a capital letter, that's the dominant gene. That's the one that if it's paired up with the other one or paired up with itself, is going to manifest itself. So because my father had brown eyes and my mother had blue eyes, I have brown eyes. My wife. One of her parents, both of her parents had blue eyes. So because I carry the genes for both of them, we had a 50-50 chance of having brown-eyed having brown kids or blue-eyed kid. Now that's not a big thing when you're talking about advantageous because, you know, not too many people do selection by the color of eyes. But there are times when it becomes pretty critical. This is the genetic cross diagram for cystic fibrosis. If you have a parent that carries you notice the capital F is, does not carry cystic fibrosis. The lowercase f is carries cystic fibrosis. Well, if you have parents <clears throat> who don't have cystic fibrosis, but each of them carries the gene, they have a 25% chance right down here of producing a child who has cystic fibrosis. Now, that doesn't mean if they have four kids, one of them is definitely going to have it, but each of those kids has a 25% chance of developing cystic fibrosis, which is a terminal disease. So as you can see, that wide genetic variety stands a better chance of survival. Now those two kids who, uh, the kid who has the double F, the double capital F, does not carry the gene anymore. It is out of his genome. The ones that have the 
uppercase F and the lowercase F, they still carry that gene. And if they pair up with somebody who has the same sort of genetic match, they'll have the same chances of producing a child with cystic fibrosis. Fortunately, cystic fibrosis does not manifest itself that often in our population. Most of us are double capital F. Now, if you have a, one parent who has cystic fibrosis and one who doesn't, none of their children will have cystic fibrosis, but they will all carry the genes for it. And this is what Gregor Mendel came up with. Now, that was that the father of genetics? Mm -hmm. Good, I got that one right. <laughs> now, we're going to completely shift gears here. We're going to talk about the scientific method, so we can talk about how it applies to evolution. We start with the observation. We see something. Now, scientific discovery isn't usually one of those eureka moments. It's usually more along the lines of, well, that's odd. Or, funny, I didn't notice that before. So then you get an idea, and that idea is called hypothesis, not a theory. So when most people say, well, I have a theory, I always go, no, you don't, you have a hypothesis. You need the evidence to turn it into a theory. And you get that evidence through experimentation and research and more observation. And you gather data. And that data in natural sciences is measurable and quantifiable. Then you have to go through personal review. You look at the data and think, okay, does this actually support my hypothesis? And you keep going through, you keep trying to find holes in your own hypothesis. Because when you go up for the next, along the next level of review, <clears throat> somebody will find it if it exists. You want it to be as ironclad as possible. One of the best examples of this took place when I was in college back in 1992. A couple of fellows named Fleischman and Pons working at the <laughs> University of Utah, yeah, Joe knows who they were, who came up with cold fusion. That's the ability to, produce, to do nuclear fusion at room temperature. And if it worked, it would be great because we would have had this wonderful endless energy supply. But nobody could reproduce their results. So their hypothesis, when it went up for peer review, it didn't hold up. I'm actually way behind in my notes here. Let me get caught up here. So you ask yourself, is your hypothesis, or now, by this time, you've got a working theory, is it consistent with the observed evidence? Is it consistent with my research? Does my research back it up, or does it cause it to fail? And peer review actually goes through that process to ask those same questions. And there are three possible outcomes after peer review. Rejection. Cold fusion? No. Cold fusion in Utah, you can't get a cold beer in Utah. <laughs> Revision. Well, you're really close, but you need to go back and rethink this, and rethink this, and rethink this. And then finally, if you're good, acceptance. It becomes an accepted theory. And at that point, you can say, I have a theory. You know, you've got beyond hypothesis. So once it's accepted, so again, I'm getting ahead of my notes here. All theories, every theory, is subject to revision or rejection if new or contradictory evidence comes along. For example, Newton's theory of universal gravitation. In everyday life, it works absolutely fine, but in 1905, it had to be revised when Einstein showed that at incredibly high speeds, it doesn't work that way. Then it had to be revised again when quantum theory came about, because it doesn't work with things that are very small. In everyday life, <coughs> Newton's theory of gravitation works for things, unless you can start getting things that are really massive, really fast, or really tiny. Then you have to start using Einstein and quantum theory. Now, if you have somebody who has a theory and you disprove it, that does not mean that any theory you have is correct. There is no win-by-default scenario, and so many people who stand up against the theory of evolution that, oh, I've just proven this, I've just proven this. Great. 
but you haven't proven what you've had to say. And that's why science is such a great way of dealing with this sort of thing. Now, of course, there are some people who say, well, you just don't want my theory. There's got to be some sort of conspiracy. There is no conspiracy among scientists to keep out alternate theories. If you can come up with something that supports the evidence, that better explains a wider range of phenomena or explains an existing phenomenon better, publish. Collect your prizes, get your laudatory, go down in history. Now, when theories are rejected or asked for revision, who discovers that? Scientists. Because scientists are this wonderful self-correcting mechanism. Neil deGrasse Tyson said science is the best tool we have for not fooling ourselves. So it's scientists who go through and find, you know, if there's an error in it, they will find it and they will publish it. I'll tell you who doesn't find it. The tinfoil hat brigade who got their new degree from the University of Google. <laughs> I think I know that guy. And every theory stands or falls strictly on its own merits and the evidence that supports it. It's not what we like or what we feel good. There are some working theories out there right now I'm very uncomfortable with. I do not like the idea of you know, the expanding universe, great. The universe expanding and accelerating as it does so, I don't like that. And guess what? The universe doesn't care what I like or what makes me comfortable. Now, for evolution, because it did say in the uh, brochure that we talk about the evidence for evolution, you're looking for evidence of evolution, you're sitting on it. We all have a tailbone. Now, we actually carry in our DNA the data for producing an actual tail, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't manifest itself. It's a gene that's dormant. We have a lot of dormant genes. Yep. Maybe we're looking for evolution, maybe it's a gut feeling. Little device down there. There it says vermiform process. Most of, it know, most of us know it as an appendix. Now, there is question as to whether or not the appendix serves a function. It's actually very similar to a thing called a cecum, which you find in animals that eat a lot of leaves. And we're not that animal anymore. Our pri a lot of our primate cousins have a fully developed cecum. And it holds bacteria that helps replenish the bacteria in the gut if something goes wrong. But there's questions to whether or not it actually does serve a function because so many people do without it. I've been doing without one, it'll be 36 years in May. And I don't seem to have suffered any ill effect except having a rather large scar on my abdomen. If you could just put a finger on it. Our hands are like those of our simian cousins. And we are the only branch on that family tree that has long digits, and instead of claws, fingernails. And what you'll find is that most of the primates have that exact arrangement. Or we can start at the beginning. This is an ultrasound of a fetus, and this little thing over here, that circle, is a yolk sac. That speaks of ancestors that came from eggs. Now, we do not that yolk sac doesn't actually get yolk in it, but the yolk sac is there. And again, some of that dormant DNA, we carry in our genes the ability to produce yolk for that. We still carry that in our DNA. It's back there. Some people call it junk DNA. There isn't really junk DNA. It's just DNA we don't use anymore. We also carry the DNA for producing vitamin C. Now, we produce our own vitamin D. You've got on a sunny day. You get the right food, you produce vitamin D. But when our ancestors moved from, moved from eating leaves to eating fruit, fruit produces vitamin C. So we didn't need it. And if you get too much vitamin C, it can cause certain gastrointestinal problems. Now the guy who's off in the bushes because he's having those problems, less likely to reproduce than the guy who doesn't have that problem. <coughs> Now, 
He said, well, the topic of DNA, and this is some humans share 96, I actually read yesterday, 98.8% of our genome with chimpanzees. And people want to think of ourselves as being separate from the primates. That's 10 times smaller than the difference between rats and mice. Well, we don't think of them as being that separate. If a kid brought you a mud pie that had two blueberries in it, would you sell it as a blueberry pie? <laughs> we are upright, walking apes who happen to be able to speak. Then one of the, I'm going to look at some of the questions and the controversies. And one of those is, what about transitional forms and fossils? All fossils are transitional fossils. If for some reason my skeleton winds up on a shelf in a museum tens of thousands of years from now, I am a transitional fossil. He thinks this is as good as it gets? No, there's got to be another species that comes along, please. <laughs> and this is a, a living, I, I don't like to use the word living fossil, but this is a, an animal that shows that evolution is ongoing. This is a little bird called the kakapo, and they live in New Zealand. They are critically endangered. There are only 126 of them in the world. Their population was down to 50, so the repopulation program is working, but they are critically endangered. And they walk around on the ground. They have lost the ability to fly. They still have wings, but they don't fledge out quite the way flight wings do. They also don't have the big keel bone on their chest or the muscles that attach to it. Again, that's a lot of energy to produce that. And they're on, they were on an island that had no predators. They were the apex predator. So they didn't need that, they started walking around. But this is so recent in their development, they have not yet figured out that they don't know how to fly. So they will climb trees, leap out of the trees. Their wings do one thing, they keep them from breaking when they hit the ground. They actually can generate enough lift that they hit the ground, but they bounce rather than break. But yeah, they haven't yet figured out they don't know how to fly. My wife said they're too stupid to fly. <laughs> they're not an angry bird. <laughs> Angry birds, yeah. <laughs> then the question, if birds are descendants of dinosaurs, where is a trans transitional fossil that's half dinosaur and half bird? So you would expect a creature that had some of the attributes of a bird and some of the attributes that were more reptilian. And some people thought that he would look like that. <laughs> the crocodile. Nope. That's not quite the way it works. But two years after Darwin published On the Origin of Species, they found a fossil that had hollow bones like a bird, feathers that had pressed into the rock, that left an impression. But it also had teeth. It had long fingers. And it had a long tail. It had reptilian and avian characteristics. It was called the Archaeopteryx, which literally translates as ancient wings. There's still some questions to whether or not the Archaeopteryx could really actually fly, or if it was a glider, or if the feathers just helped keep it warm. And we found other species, species of velociraptors. I know a paleontologist who's very up in arms at the new Jurassic World film is coming out, and their raptors still don't have feathers even though all the evidence that we have seen shows that velociraptors had feathers. Then some people say, well, evolutionary scientists can't make predictions. Uh, that's a pretty good idea. This is a hawk moth. You notice it has that long, curly proboscis. Well, that straightens out, and it's designed for reaching in the bottom of an orchid to get the nectar. Well, Darwin himself had seen these, and he saw an orchid that was too long for any of the known species of hawk moths. And he predicted that sometime in the future, someone would find a hawk moth that had a proboscis that was long enough to reach the bottom. So naturally, when it was found, it became known as Darwin's hawk moth. It was named after him. Now, Neil Shubin, he wrote a wonderful book called Your Inner Fish. And uh, he also did a mini-series about that. He was a, he's a fish um, anatomist, but he also had an interest in paleontology. And he was working with uh, 
a geologist, and there's always the question about, you know, if life started on, in the water, how did it move to land? Where's the transitional form of this? So what they did is they figured approximately when it would happen, about 385 million years ago. So they looked for outcroppings of rock from that age. Well, there were some in Pennsylvania, but they didn't find anything when they were looking there. But they also noticed on a map in a college textbook, five minutes, I'm getting there, in a college <laughs> textbook, I'm almost there actually, an outcropping like that in northern Canada. So they went out on an expedition, and they were actually one of those, well, it's about time for us to start packing up and heading. When one guy disappeared one, and they didn't know where he was, and he came running into the tent at the end of the day and said, you have got to see this. And they found Tiktaalik, a creature that had, that lived in the water, that had characteristics of fish, but it had that flat head. And it also had bones in its arms. The same arrangement we have. One bone, two bones, multiple bones, digits. It's also interesting to note that the whale inside of its fluke has fingers. It has that arrangement. One bone, two bones, multiple bones, digits. It also, inside of its body, serving no function, it doesn't anchor muscles, but they have the re remains, the vestigial remnants of hind legs. And it was predicted that they would find an ancestor, and they found what's called ambulocetans, the walking whale. So you remember I started saying, I don't believe in evolution? Well, you know what? I still don't. I accept modern evolutionary theory is the best explanation for the diversity of life on this planet. There hasn't been a better explanation. And a Russian scientist named, I want to get his name right, Theodosius Dobzhansky put it best when he said, nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution. I told you I was almost right. <laughs> So I guess we're going to take a little break now, and then after the break, we can have some questions and answers.